we're going to do this morning, as I said, signing off, we're going to, as much as we were coming very close to the finish line on S10, this intervening development is uh, more urgent. Uh, we have a technical deadline of March 31st to get the governor to sign S10, uh, but I think we have a realistic deadline of much sooner to get actions in motion on the 1099 <laughs> issue. Uh, yesterday, because of the newness commissioner of the issue, I think at least I was uh, more focused on uh, how we were going to correct the problem in terms of getting the right 1099s out and avoiding confusion with the uh, uh, claimants who got these things. Um, but it quickly, uh, by the end of the morning, it quickly became more apparent that the uh, one of the more urgent things that needed to be addressed is how we prevent or cure uh, uh, to the fullest extent possible identity theft. Uh, and um, so uh, with that said, why don't you, with that said, I've invited members from the attorney general's office. They have dealt with identity theft issues. We've dealt with identity theft bills in this committee at the time of uh, Equifax and other big breaches. Uh, so there are experts in the state on identity theft. So they're going to give us some of the details. But I wanted to give you a, a first uh, opportunity, Commissioner, to tell us what you're thinking, what you're doing, who you've been in contact, and uh, you know, and what kind of resources you might be looking at. Uh, but we want to be all over this because it's no fun having your identity stolen. Uh, absolutely agree. Um, I, you know, I want to I want to distinguish at least the difference between identity theft and and a compromised identity, um, and and that is only just so we are speaking in clear terms. So right now, what we have is a situation where um, individual Vermonters have had uh, their identity, or I should say, um, you know, their personal identifiable information or PII compromised. Um, we, we do not at this time know of any distinct cases where someone's identity was stolen or used improperly. Um, that being said, it doesn't remove um, the significance of the situation we're in. So uh, just to recap, um, we had, uh, a number of 1099s that went out the door uh, late last week uh, and uh, found out on Monday um, that there had been a, a processing issue in um, the transfer of the data from the mainframe system uh, and our other systems for managing the benefit programs to when uh, the 1099s were printed uh, and then eventually mailed. Um, and we're we're working to identify, uh, you know, where that that failure occurred in the process. Um, but essentially, what ended up happening is a, a series of of social security numbers and, in some cases, corresponding names, uh, ended up being mailed to uh, someone other than the person whose name or social security uh, number was on the document. Um, we, we are narrowing that population as we speak. Can I ask a uh, clarifying question? Yes, ma'am. I It might just be semantics, but I think I just heard you say their name or social security number. Do you have reason to believe that in all the documents, it would have been the same person's name and social security number? So we have cases where the name and the social are not corresponding and do not match. And we have names and social situations where the name and the social do match. Um, so we have both. Um, again, it, it looks like um, it was likely a human error or manual error in the way um, the file was was eventually uh, sorted, uh, maybe for printing or mailing purposes, I don't know right now, um, but it's it looks like um, the way the file was was sorted, um, you know, caused the information to be uh, shuffled uh, within the within the the file. 
um, which then got printed and mailed. Um, so we've got a number of different uh, actions uh, going on, uh, and I see um, Senator Brock has his hand up. Senator Brock. Just a brief question. When you say the information may have been uh, sorted uh, improperly during a transfer, was this something in which data was transferred from the mainframe to an Excel spreadsheet and then processed uh, from? Well, so it, it depends on the program. Um, the VSTS program uh, and the and the LWA program were managed outside of the mainframe. Um, so some of those records uh, come from uh, a, a spreadsheet that was already being kept for purposes of managing those programs. Um, we did have to validate and cross-check that against mainframe data. Uh, and then we also had to validate and cross-check that against our uh, financial records for how many benefits were paid to each individual. Um, so there was, uh, it's likely, and I, I don't want to speak um, in concrete because I just don't know the answer yet, um, but it's likely it was some type of Excel spreadsheet um, that was then used for printing purposes um, that then got shuffled. So uh, Commissioner, just... Uh trying to get an idea of the scope here because yesterday we mentioned the number 55,000 several times and I reviewed the transcript and at the end you're saying the real number of people who are in danger of having their information misused by another person be far lower. Maybe I misunderstood that but are we dealing with in terms of um, I mean, we don't know what the cure is yet, but to deal with the uh, really people who are threatened with having their social security and name given to a third party's, a third citizen's hands, what is that number? So we, and uh, thank you for the opportunity to clarify, because I also think it, it hasn't necessarily been clear in the media as well. So in total, and this includes the, the PUA program, the LWA program, the VSTS program, and the $1,200 prepay program. In total of those four programs that were mailed, that represents about 75 to 80,000 1099 documents. Not people, but documents. So we are working to identify of that total population, how many unique individuals does that represent? To date, the only... Um, the only uh, uh, errors that have been reported to us are on two of those four mailings, and that is the LWA mailing and the Vermont short-term supplemental benefit mailing. So between those two mailings, that actually takes the 80, um, that, that 80,000, and drops it down. And we do know that in those two mailings that the total impacted population is roughly 44,800. What, what we don't know yet is that there was a whole number of, uh, of those files that never made it to the mail. So they were stopped in the post office uh, and returned to the department having never been delivered. And so when I, what I don't know right now is of the 44,800, you know, whether or not um, we can even chop that number down even more and potentially get it closer, you know, closer to the actual impacted population. And so what we're working to do is get a handle on um, whether or not the, there are people in that file that never made it out the door. Um, and are, are those 44,800 uh, people or documents? The 44,800 are people. Okay. Okay. Uh, and, and, and I think just from, I, I would just say from a, from a, a, a security and being overly uh, sensitive and cautious in this scenario, um, I mean, we are likely looking at the 44,800 as the, as the total potential uh, impacted population. And that's the population we will be working with going forward. Um, and then I think we will also be looking to see whether or not there are opportunities based on the mail that was returned where we can actually remove people from that, that 44,800. So my, my final question on the numbers here 
let's assume the 44,000 gets cut in half to 22,000 because half of them didn't get mailed and get sent back to you from the post office. Of that 22,000, how many, or is there any guesstimate, how many of them have problematic errors in them that would cause people to be concerned with the potential for identity theft? That's what I thought you were saying. Yes. Yeah, so I would, I would treat that right now, based on what we absolutely know, we are treating the 44,800 as the total population where uh, they would have had their data released. Let's put it that way. I think we are now working to say, how do we um, remove people from that and give some reassurance to folks that maybe their data um, still resides in uh, in our, our office downstairs. Um, and, and that's, but I think from a, from a security perspective, we are working at, at the 44,800 as our starting point of impacted population. I'm not, maybe I'm not being clear. Uh, I understand that taking a conservative approach, which we need to do here, that we want to help those 44,000 people. But I guess the simplest way I can ask this question how many of those 44,000 mailings, whatever, had the correct information in them? Or did every single one of them have wrong information in them, sent to the wrong person? Yeah, so I, to what you were saying before. So um, what I do know is that, so of the two populations, the LWA population right now, based on the preliminary numbers we've pulled, um, there were, uh, 39,126 LWA 1099s that were mailed. The number of the number of 1099s in that batch that um, exposed someone's identity was less than 20 in total. Okay. The, however, of the Vermont short-term supplemental benefit, that total number of um, pieces was, so I'm gonna say there were 34,043 that were printed and roughly, you know, 18-ish thousand that actually went out the door. And so of the 18,000 that went out the door, almost all of those, had corrupted information in them. So I think you're right in your assessment, Mr. Chair, that the actual population of people that are, are likely impacted is somewhere around 18 to 20,000, maybe right. as, as many as 25,000. And I think we'll, get, we'll be able to narrow that as we see um, what exactly exists uh, as we're, we're going through the mail. I think what we're also trying to be mindful of is the immediate need is getting clear information to claimants, getting those that want protection, protection. And I don't want to, I, I don't want to lose time by having people conducting counting downstairs before we mail anything out. So I think we are going to treat the 44,800 as our starting point of letting them know that they are potentially impacted from a security perspective, letting them know that the department will provide coverage to them and letting them know that we will notify them at a later date if we find that they were not involved in the impacted population. Um, but Keisha I think has a, okay, yeah, for Keisha the sake of time, we're working with the 44,000 right now. Senator Rahm. I, I have a couple questions. I wanna share some positive feedback first. Um, I did hear from people from my, um, and you know, kind of trying to give them information via from form quickly, that those who got emails felt a lot better from receiving the email. It gave them a lot of helpful information. Um, I so I'm wondering about people who don't have emails. If there is, you know, if the mailing is the only thing they're getting, or they there is a universe you know of that don't have emails where you could give them a call instead. And the second thing I'm wondering is there's a small but really deeply impacted population of people that may not speak English well, for whom something about their identity and their identification numbers is very scary to not understand. 
So I'm just wondering if, if you can talk about any language access work you're doing. So um, most of the population has emails because they had to uh, use an email address to file for benefits. Um, there are cases where someone may have already had an open claim uh, before our online application went live at the start of the pandemic. Um, so there are, at times when we look at the, the total population, people who, um, who don't have an email. I have made a note so we can look to see of the 44,800, um, how many emails do we have for those people on record? Um, and that, I'm hoping that can be a relatively uh, quick process. Um, and then we do have the ability um, to, to one, send out an automated phone message to those folks. Although I think if we're talking about um, information sharing, you know, the, the letter that they receive, hopefully in the next um, seven to 10 days, will be um, certainly more valuable to them uh, and provide them the information they need at their fingertips. Um, and then uh, from language access perspective, um, you know, I've also made a note. So when we are, when we are mailing out that information, um, we're providing language access opportunities for them. Just so you know, our call center does, um, we did enroll, uh, you know, or sign up or subscribe. So there is um, the ability for any of our agents, if they have uh, someone who, um, where, uh, English is not their primary language um, or have trouble understanding, you know, we can, we can call an 800 number and uh, loop in an interpreter. Um, and we, I don't know how many times we've used that, but I do know we've used that in the past. So, so I just want to reiterate, Commissioner, what I was trying to say yesterday, and it's a language issue of another sort. I really encourage you to run by what you're mailing out or involve earlier on some advocacy groups who deal with populations like claimants, maybe it's um, people from legal aid to make sure it's communicated in language that recipients who speak English are gonna understand and doesn't get wrapped up in bureaucratic things and covering your rear end and all the legal requirements of what you have to say. But I've seen that over and over again in my unfortunately very lengthy career where some of the advocacy groups look at letters that come out of the administration and they just cannot believe that that kind of letter has been sent by uh, a governmental official. Uh, it almost thwarts the purpose of what you're trying to ach achieve because it gets people so confused um so try and try and reach out to you know somebody maybe call the director of vermont legal aid and say you have somebody who'll be willing to help us on this it could be just a review or they could be involved in the beginning stages but uh i think it'll go a long way towards uh advancing what you're trying to do here anyhow enough said um so to, yeah. to your question, uh, Mr. Chair, just so folks know, there are there are three major components in this response plan. One is recapturing the 1099s that went out. Just so you know, I mean, I even got an email today. Um, there were we got roughly 2,000 pieces of mail uh, today already of either ones that um, made it to various post offices but never made it to the recipient. Um, and so the post office caught it and are now sending it back to the department. Uh, or we've had uh, individuals who uh, literally went out of their way to say, this isn't me and returned it to the department already. So um, I, you know, that's good news um, that hopefully that will continue over the coming days as we still send out information to folks. Um, and then uh, the second, and but I, I say second, but it's happening simultaneously is um, the, the piece around the exposure um, of, of identities. So we are working on drafting that. We have been uh, in touch uh, regularly over the past two or three days with the attorney general's office, including this morning. Uh, on a call with our general counsel who is here, Dirk Anderson um, and myself. Uh, so we are working closely with them um, to make sure we're complying and also focused on consumer protection uh, processes and, and rights. 
and responsibilities. Um, and I know they're here today and, and appreciate their support that they've given us so far. And then the third is obviously the mailing of the new 1099 um, to individuals, which will likely happen uh, you know, later this month. I think we're trying to make sure that we people get clear messaging about returning the faulty 1099 before we start issuing them a new 1099. So there is no confusion about which one they need to return. Um, we're also taking every opportunity to remind uh, folks that we're, we're only talking about 1099s that came from the Department of Labor that were received at the start of this week. And I say that because there are many other agencies and departments that will be issuing 1099s in the coming weeks. And so, um, you know, they should be focused only on uh, the 1099s that came from the Department of Labor and that were received uh, during the week of the first. Um, and those are the ones that, that are, were needing return. Yeah, and on your communication, Michael, it's you've improved the website so that when you go to the website now, it says right away at the top, 1099 improper mailing and data incident updates. So that's an improvement over yesterday. So good work on that. Yeah, I, yeah and that came from obviously conversations and an email from Senator Sorokin. Um, nice work, good teamwork. Yeah, we immediately turned around and, and made sure we, we made that yeah, promise. That um, needed and, an improvement. Senator Brock. Uh, Commissioner, I know that the, the immediate focus is as it ought to be on remediating the problem and, uh, and, and getting back to, to, to where we ought to be. Uh, on a longer term basis, do you plan uh, a form of independent review to examine not just what happened in this case, but the whole processing environment in which it did happen? And so, if so I, what can you tell us about that? Yeah, sorry, and I didn't mean to interrupt there, so my apology. Uh, Yes, twofold. One is um, having an independent review or audit done of what occurred, so the incident itself. Um, and so that is uh, the plan. And I already know, you know, whether it's um, from the public or, or obviously from other legislature legislators, there's an interest there. So I would just um, let people know that that is already something uh, we are planning to do. Uh, and, um, and just to so they know that, that we are aware of that and that is part of our expectation, it's part of my expectation that we review uh, and identify exactly where the incident happened, uh, the gap in the system, so that we can also get corrective actions in place um, to prevent that in the future. But to your other point, we, uh, the department, and I've made this um, my own personal uh, position, need to double down or even triple down on our quality control and quality assurance efforts um, across the department, but obviously specifically in the, the unemployment insurance area. Uh, and so we will be looking at, uh, at other ways to, to um, one, look at the system, but also what level of processes, procedures, and expertise do we need to bring on board um, to make sure that we're, we're ensuring quality going forward. Um, and and it, well, yes, I, I see a couple of hands up, so I'll stop there. Senator Clarkson. Well, clearly, one of the, the issues that uh, it appears to perhaps be partially at fault here is the transmission of data from a mainframe to a, uh, an Excel spreadsheet that's then manipulated. And that probably uh, is one of the top, if not the top, causes of failures that that, that folks see in audits, uh, financial audits, for example, it's, it's a real danger signal. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, it's, it's frustrating because our, our, our team spent so much time validating the data from the mainframe to just have a, a human error um, yeah. and accident occur. Um, you know, our, someone asked me yesterday, you know, can the mainframe be to blame? And I, I don't think so necessarily in this case, but I do think the antiquated systems we have are, right. So the fact that we're now shuffling data from multiple programs and processes and having to do much of it in a manual fashion instead of an automated fashion, just like you said, Senator, increase the opportunity uh, for error to occur. Well, there's good news and bad news in that. And the bad news is that there are other departments in state government with antiquated systems who are doing exactly what you're doing. And so one of the lessons, perhaps, for all of us is it's, it, it is 
there is a likelihood that something like this is going to happen again somewhere else in state government unless we get our act together. Yeah, and, and the risk is there, and and certainly you know we need to to double down on that. I will say uh, I'll I'll put a plug out there or a shout out. Um, you know, we immediately had a call from our our colleagues in Connecticut, um, right. in the yeah. UI division. <laughs> Uh, mm -hmm. And they actually went through something very similar uh, back in, I think, 2013. Um, so mm -hmm. they, they essentially gave us their, their playbook, if you will, for mm -hmm. how they responded and, and then what they did to ensure going forward that it didn't happen again. So, uh, you know, I will give a, a plug to, to our, our folks there, um, you know, appreciate their active reaching out to us and saying, how can we help? Senator Rahm. Um, I I have, I'm trying to sort of paraphrase some, some questions I've received. Um, one being there are, there are people asking about whether or not they should download something online. It, it, are they able, you have a service where people can get their 1099G online instead of mailed to them. And is that not compromised? Is that a better place for them to look? And are they, um, it, are you eventually going to have something where they can, you know, like when this has happened with Target or Best Buy, I know that's very different, but you've been able to type in your name and someone could say, yes, it's likely that your, you, your information was compromised. Okay. Like people want to be able to verify that. And then that FAQ says, here's who to call because you're worried about your identity. You know, here, here's our free service for you because, because of that concern. Mm -hmm. Um, are you, do you think it's gonna, and plus when I ask that, I'm also wondering as budget adjustment goes through the legislature, if this requires some kind of emergency appropriation to really to really get this right and make sure people are safe because this is just the last thing people need right now. Yeah, so uh, to that question, I may ask Cameron to, to answer the question about um, accessing their 1099 online. I don't know if we've actually put them online yet, um, and but if they are, I would say that um, the the data that w the data that they would be accessing online um, is not obviously the same file that got printed, um, and so the the information in the systems was was accurate. Although um, I we're also talking about two programs that don't currently exist in our mainframe. So they are likely what they would be accessing if they went into our mainframe. Uh, or through um, the Salesforce application or actually the unemployment insurance, the regular UI 1099, which actually hasn't been mailed yet, uh, or the PUA 1099, which while we were asking everybody to return all 1099s, right now we have no reports that there were actually any issues with the PUA 1099s that got mailed. Um, but instead of having to force someone to try to figure out which one is which, we're just gonna uh, have them return all of them and collect them. Um, but Cameron, if you want to speak to that, and then I can I can speak to the other part there. Just very quickly, Senator Rahm, I, I will validate what the commissioner just said. Um, you know, we do take the 1099s for the regular UI program, and we make those accessible through our traditional claimant portal. Uh, we had not yet done that, so I believe if they go into their claimant portal at this point in time, they would actually be able to access their previous 1099 from a prior year if they had one. But there is no indication at this point that our, our traditional UI 1099s were incorrect. Uh, and as the commissioner mentioned, we haven't yet mailed those. Uh, and the same thing with the PUA. Um, there's no indi indi there is no indication at this point through our investigation that the PUA 1099s are incorrect. So I would say that- But you're saying online they can't get 2020 1099. For the, the regular UI, not, UI, not, not yet. yet. We have okay. not uploaded those files into the claimant portal um, but they, they shouldn't be concerned about pulling information from the web, from our claimant portal or from the PUA portal, because what they would be pulling would be 1099s that um, we, in our investigation, have not determined they are inaccurate. Okay. What we're limited to the inaccuracies, as the commissioners mentioned, are the LWA and the Vermont Short-Term Supplemental Program and unfortunately, those we will not be putting online to be able to download at this point in time. Um, 
you know, at, at least at a minimum until we're able to resolve these outstanding issues. But we didn't at the time have any indication of putting those online. So I just want to reassure people, your constituents, that if they're grabbing information uh, online, it, it would be accurate. But it would not be updated. And one person emailed me and said, you know, their their understanding is that the sooner they file their taxes, the less exposure they have to the possibility of some kind of breach of identity or identity theft. I don't know if you think there's something to that getting their information to them sooner helps them file their taxes sooner and avoid some kind of issue that they might have. Uh, I don't think so. I would obviously kind of uh, probably refer that question to maybe the AG's office or somebody in the state with better expertise. I'm, I'm not aware of any of anything filing sooner is, is, is going to somehow protect them in a situation like this. Uh, we do have to upload our 1099 files to the state tax department and to the IRS. Uh, one thing we've tried to assure individuals is um, we have not done that yet. The deadline for that is later than the date to mail 1099s. So try to reassure individuals that we have not uploaded incorrect information to either the state tax department or the IRS. We will ensure that that information is accurate when it gets uploaded. Well, Commissioner, um, I'm going to ask you for a favor here. Uh, there's so much information being shared here so rapidly. Uh, I would like if you could maybe in a one or two page memo layout, bullet points or whatever, the action plan as of today, knowing it's subject to change and that you could periodically update it. Uh, but it's really hard to stay abreast of what's going on. I think we have a need and a right to know what's going on. So if you could prepare a memo to us of where you're going at this point, I'm less concerned about all the history, but the history obviously will play in. And secondly, I want to move on because we're going to move on to the AG, but what is the action plan in terms of people's concern that their identity may be compromised? And what are we telling people today and what could they look forward to in the future to help allay their fears and also provide protection against bad things happening going forward. Uh, yeah, thank you, um, Senator. And I'm just pulling up, I believe it was um, was in our weekly update or update to the legislature, um, but I just wanna pull it up. So uh, as you know, folks received an email uh, last night if they were in any of those four populations. Um, and at the bottom, uh, it did identify, um, you know, next steps and actions that they could take immediately um, to protect themselves against identity theft. Um, you know, whether it's the the recommendation to obviously monitor their various accounts, credit cards, financial statements, and so on, but it also gave contact information for the three major credit bureaus to be able to, um, you know, add an alert or freeze to their credit report. Um, it also provided them two federal um, locations online, um, one identitytheft.gov, uh, which comes out of the Federal Trade Commission uh, for reporting identity cases of identity theft, um, and then uh, usa.gov, which actually provides um, a series of tips for protecting your identity. So that went out yesterday. Um, once we, now that we know this population of people who actually had their information um, you know, exposed to some degree, um, we will now be ramping up uh, our communication to them um, through email, letting them know next steps. But the actual physical actions from the department um, will be a mailing uh, that goes out to the exposed population next week. Uh, and uh, in that mailing, it will give them uh, instructions. And, and my understanding is our general counsel will be working with the AG's office on um, appropriate language as well, but it will give them uh, a lay of the land, if you will, uh, for their exposure and, and what the department has an obligation to uh, notify them of, uh, and it will also give them uh, next steps for how to enroll in protection services um, should they choose. 
Uh, and so we are working through the logistics of how to get them uh, the opportunity to enroll uh, at, you know, at no expense to the, to the consumer in this case. Um, to Senator Rahm's question about uh, appropriations, we have already had that started me, happening. Let me interrupt for a second. Um, so just an example, I was unaware of this email. I haven't seen it. People like myself are talking to the press without all updated information. So this is another reason why it'd be good to have a memo for the committee and an update of that things as things go. So please include us as policymakers in these uh, in these mailings that go out to recipients. Um, it's really important that we have information in real time. Um, uh, I'm not, uh, it sounds like you're doing a lot to, to get the information out. Uh, I, I have some discomfort, I don't know if it's shared by other committee members, that this information is going out next week sometime in a letter, which may be received eight or 10 days from now, people are worried today. Um, and I'm wondering if there's something preliminarily that can be done to get things out as widely as possible. Maybe your email of last night, which I haven't seen, does that. But uh, you know, maybe it should be a statement by the governor, a statement in the press, uh, some kind of thing where people will say, we have a lot of, we are moving forward on a lot of fronts and this is containable, uh, stay tuned. Uh, I just feel that there's probably a lot of people out there that have gotten bits and pieces and are, are worried and um, government moves slow, but there perhaps are preliminary steps that can let the public uh, no, and you know, it, and it, I think it needs to be. We've got members of this committee who are great with social media and getting out words and front porch forum and stuff like that, but that's not a coordinated fashion. You know, the message could get garbled or mixed and uh, maybe dated. Um, I don't know, I'm going on and on, but I hope you get the sense of what I'm trying to say here. Uh, absolutely. Um, and I think that, you know, there's a balance there between obviously wanting to get information out timely, but also making sure we actually have something to tell folks. Um, and so I think the email last night was the start of that. Uh, and then I, there will be few, I don't want you to think that there will be no communication between the email last night and the letter that goes out next week. I think what we are trying to figure out is how to enroll these folks in protection. And we just don't have that solution just yet. So we're, we're working through that process right now. Um, but I would even say when the, when the physical mailing goes out, there's absolutely no reason we can't email those folks at the same time to let them know the same information in a more timely fashion, right? So right. even if we mail it on Monday, we may email them on Monday so they have it immediately. They may get the letter later in the week. Um, but there's some logistical things we're trying to figure out in terms of actually what do we want to tell them to do? Um, but we will actually be contacting them over the course of this week as well. I would also just point out, just so you are aware, Mr. Chair and the committee, um, we did, I did have a conversation yesterday with the pro tem and the speaker um, and, and gave them a status update. Um, we did agree that the department would be providing talking points um, uh, to, to them to share with legislators uh, so that they would um, be in the loop and be able to provide constituents with clear uh, direction. Um, we also did, like you said, talk about how do we enhance the messaging that is going on out there um, from what's being posted on the department's social media and how do we, how do we just um, make sure uh, legislators are in the loop and could even enhance the spread of, of that accurate information. So we are having those conversations, so you are aware. I appreciate it. It's a heavy lift. Uh, thanks for your uh, time this morning. We're gonna move on to the AG, but I, uh, before we do, um, you mentioned in, uh, in certain contexts, the idea of steps that people can take with 
credit credit agencies. Uh, reporting. Oh, Senator, I think we lost your your um, microphone. Can you hear me, Michael? Now? Yeah, we can. we can hear you. It just Becca came on briefly. Uh, yeah, well, we just got interrupted. You, you made reference to steps people might be taking with third party uh, agencies, and I assume the, those come with some fees or costs. Is it the department's position to reimburse? Uh, people who use those services? I, I may defer to the AG, but um, in my experience, I've been able to add uh, uh, alerts and fraud alerts and um, a credit freeze to my account personally, which I did many, many months ago um, as we saw fraud uh, sweeping the nation. Uh, and it has not cost me anything. And I don't know if that's a, a long-term no cost or simply an adjustment that was made during COVID. As you know, there were other adjustments made where people could get um, their credit reports more frequently during COVID without a cost. Um, so again, I may turn to the AG to, to talk about that. I think at this point, our, um, you know, the, the area where we're focused on in terms of covering the cost would actually be true uh, credit protection and, and monitoring service uh, through a third party vendor. Um, so I, but I do think the things we recommended yesterday were all at, at no cost to the consumer. The latter thing you were referring to, you're saying that you are willing to, can you hear me? We can. Uh, you're saying the administration's position is those are the third party services you are willing to pay for? Uh, we are. I think what my caveat there would be, you know, the department is working to find a vendor um, that it can uh, enter into an agreement with. Um, so what I don't want people to do, because we don't have a mechanism for reimbursing individuals right now, so I don't want people to go out and sign up and then expect and then ask the department to then cover the cost because we don't have a way to reimburse right now. What we have traditionally done in the past and what is best practice of what I've heard other states do is that we enter into a, an agreement with a third party vendor. We then, you know, whether it's the vendor gives us a, a code to use and we give that code to the consumer. So when they enroll, they can use a code um, that then makes it free to them to enroll. So. Right. Um, Again, I don't want people going out individually. Um, and, and, you know, we, we are also trying to control um, how they enroll, but also the cost associated with that. Um, although the cost is not the, the primary factor here, um, but certainly we want to be able to control the, the cost of this. Right. And, we are, and, we, are, and I just say, we are also talking with risk management to see whether or not uh, any of these costs would be covered under, um, you know, our self-insured plan. Are you, Mr. Uh, Chair? Yes. Can you can you hear me? Yes, uh, we can, uh, Becca. Here. Okay, just just a quick a quick uh, request of the commissioner. Um, going back to what the chair said, if you if your shop could get to uh, the speaker's office in my office sometime this morning, a copy of the email that went out to uh, Vermonters. Uh, yesterday, that would be a big help so that I can direct people to that when I speak to senators on the floor at one. Absolutely. We'll send Thank it you. Right. Yeah, we'll send it right now. Uh, yeah. This 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 contracting with a third party, are you in the process of moving forward with that? Is there any reason to delay on that? No, we are moving forward. I think we're trying to find out whether or not the state already has a vendor that it uses. Um, so my understanding is we've been, you know, reaching out to maybe other uh, agencies or departments and even procurement to see whether or not we have a vendor we have used in the past. Um, and like I said, there are there are many options out there. So identifying the one um, that can meet our needs and, and moving forward. So that's already underway. Okay. Thank you, Commissioner. Let's Thank move you. on. With We've got about 10 minutes or a little bit more if need be for the Attorney General's office. Uh, Charity or Ryan, who is, who's the best person to get us started on what the law requires and what you've seen 
in the past, if there have been any analogous situations here or in other states, and most importantly, what aggressively can we do to uh, make people feel more comfortable and to stop further leaks or thefts here? Mr. Chair, I'll, I'll just get us started and acknowledging the time crunch won't say much um, to begin. Ryan, of course, is our Assistant Attorney General who is a subject matter expert on data privacy and data breaches like, um, like this one. First, um, I am the Chief of Staff Charity Clark um, for the Attorney General and I also want to acknowledge that Wednesdays are remote learning day in my school district and so with me is my six-year-old so if we are interrupted, I apologize. Um, so let me just begin by saying this is, it's very serious and I want to acknowledge that Vermonters have a right and, and, and should be able to trust in government and um, the government let them down. Um, so it's, uh, here we are. We, the Attorney General's office have been in regular communication with the Department of Labor offering resources and what support we have um, to, to give. Really in this arena, there's two areas where our office intersects um, with what's happening. And the first Ryan will speak to, and that's the, uh, the Data Breach Notice Act. And the second is our consumer assistance program who are really the experts on helping um, Vermonters with identity theft troubles. And I can say a lot about that um, as probably some of you know, um, but I, I don't want to say too much because Ryan can answer, I think a lot of questions about the, about the act. Let me just direct you to a couple of resources. The first is of course, you can call CAP or email CAP and it's 1-800-649-2424. You can also just email them. Um, it's ago.cap at vermont.gov. They, they have incredible amounts of information, which I won't go into here since we're, we're tight on time, but also wanted to direct you to, we have a blog, a CAP blog. And anytime you have a question about a consumer issue, you can just search on the blog and guarantee you that there will be some sort of a resource available. It's on our website. If you just go to like the news media section on the, our homepage, you can click on that and you'll see there's press releases and there's CAP communications or CAP, CAP connections is the name of the blog. So I wanted to just offer that if you have constituents who have concerns, there's lots of resources there. Um, but I don't wanna um, take up too much time because I know Ryan has a lot of info to share. So why don't I just turn it over to Ryan to um, tell us about the Data Breach Notice Act. Thanks, Ryan. Thank you, Charity. Um, feel free to interrupt with any questions. Uh, Senator? Go ahead. Okay. Um, so we deal with a lot of data breaches uh, in, I work in the, uh, sorry, my name is Ryan Krieger. I'm an assistant attorney general in, in the consumer protection division. Um, and one of our responsibilities is handling data breaches. Uh, we recently announced a Sabre breach. We handled Equifax. Unfortunately, this is a fairly common occurrence. There are two primary laws that data breaches fall under that we enforce in this area. The first is the Security Breach Notice Act, which I can, uh, I'll run down in just a second. Importantly, the Security Breach Notice Act, uh, under its language, applies to both private businesses and government agencies. So government agencies must comply with the Security Breach Notice Act. The second law we enforce in this area is the Consumer Protection Act. And basically we have interpreted that and all the other states and the Federal Trade Commission have interpreted that to say that if a business lacks reasonable data security, uh, that can be considered an unfair or in some cases a deceptive act under the Consumer Protection Act. Um, similarly, if a business fails to remediate appropriately in the wake of a breach, that could be an unfair act. Now the Consumer Protection Act, however, does not apply to government agencies. Uh, it only applies to businesses and, and operations in commerce. So what that means is that from the Consumer Protection Division's point of view, uh, we have responsibility to making sure that any government agency complies with the Notice Act as far as having reasonable data security or what happens if there wasn't, uh, we are available to advise. Uh, we are available to you know, uh, provide information like this but I don't think we have any authority to bring any sort of enforcement actions. Um, I don't think we have, and if we don't have authority to bring an enforcement action, I don't know that we have authority to bring an investigation in that matter. Um, 
Now, as far as the Notice Act goes, uh, we've talked at length about the Notice Act over the years uh, in this committee. Uh, it requires a preliminary notification to the Vermont Attorney General's office within 14 days of having the breach. Uh, that has happened. Uh, the notice itself is confidential, although I think that the Department of Labor is being pretty transparent in, in how they've been operating here, but I can confirm that they've complied. Um, the notice to consumers, which the contents of that are listed in detail in the act, has to go out in the most expedient time possible and without unreasonable delay, but no later than 45 days. Uh, I haven't heard anything to indicate that they're not planning on getting that notice out as soon as they can. So as far as our division goes, from the information we have at the moment, it appears that they are in compliance with uh, the Security Breach Notice Act. Um, the Notice Act does not require the provision of identity theft uh, protection products. Some states have actually started requiring credit reporting. Uh, ID theft is uh, a better product than the credit reporting product. So it's, it's heartening to know that the Department of Labor is planning on doing that. Uh, that is the good protection for consumers. Uh, the question was raised about uh, credit freezes and things like that. Uh, credit freezes, uh, there used to be a fee associated with them in the wake of Equifax. Our state and many other states passed laws eliminating those fees. The fees was actually a statutory fee that was required in state law. So um, anyone who is concerned about personal identity theft can and should go to the three credit reporting agencies and ask for a credit freeze. And the way we advise people to do that is to Google uh, Federal Trade Commission or FTC credit freeze. They have a website that has links to each of the individual credit reporting agencies. And then you can go through that and you can do that freeze. You can also put a fraud alert on. The, uh, the fraud alert lasts for one year and basically it flags your file so that if someone pulls your credit report, they have to call you directly and say, did you intend to open this file? Um, the freeze is, I think, more effective. It's also a little bit more burdensome to implement. Um, so that, that's kind of a, a general authority. The, the other area, by the way, that, that our office is involved in, in areas like this is uh, if there is identity theft, if identity theft uh, results from, you know, specifically tax fraud identity theft, uh, it is common every year around tax time for there to be a certain amount of ID theft fraud in the form of someone filing a tax return uh, in order to you know, get, get a refund that they don't deserve. Um, and uh, Senator Ram asked about the filing fast, you know, what is that? And, and the, the notion is that you know, if, an, you know, you, if someone has stolen your identity and an ID thief is going to file in your wake, then you wanna get your filing in first. Uh, at the very least, what that would mean is if you file after the identity thief, then what's gonna happen is the tax department is gonna see two filings and say, okay, one of these was false or not. That doesn't mean you're necessarily not gonna get your filing back. Uh, but it would probably be, you'll get a, a faster return if you get it in, get your return, and then the fraudster you know, tries to commit the identity theft. theft. Uh, plus, it's always better to get your money back faster, you know, uh, earn that interest on, on your money instead of the state. Um, so as far as if identity theft uh, results from tax filings, uh, I, I've actually spoken with the Department of Taxes. They have a fraud investigation unit. Um, and if they uh, identify any identity theft, uh, they will communicate with the Attorney General's office. Uh, we will be the uh, point of contact for people, you know, having identity theft uh, uh, resulting from that. It should it happen, and in any given year, it may happen, not just because of of this. And then we will work with the state's attorneys. And we will, you know, determine the best course of action as far as, you know, if there is a, a, a verified example, you know, bringing enforcement actions or prosecutions or, or things like that. So that would be the other area that we would be involved in. Uh, I think that's kind of the general overview, of it, but I'm, I'm happy to take questions. Thank, thank you, Ryan. Always a pleasure to have you here. Um, you've given us a lot of legal requirements. Uh, put yourself in the shoes of one of these UI recipients now who's read about this 
snafu and is concerned about identity theft, what's your advice for them? Well, my advice for them would be the same advice that we were giving out after the Equifax breach, which I think affected half of Vermonters. Um, you know, it's, it's a really unfortunate thing, but I think all Vermonters should assume that their social security number has been acquired by someone in some context. Uh, data breaches have become so ubiquitous in this area. So what can you do? Freeze your credit reports is, is the single most uh, uh, effective way that you can protect yourself because if your credit reports are frozen, that means that no one can open up a loan account in your name. It can't happen. A bank calls Experian and says, someone is trying to open an account. Experian won't release your credit report. So the bank can't open an account. So, you know, and, and pretty much when you think about identity theft, you're talking about people taking out loans in your name or opening credit cards in your name. None of that can happen. Um, you know, we actually had some legislation where we talked about the possibility of uh, making it easier for people to do that. Uh, also, in the wake of Equifax, the federal uh, a federal law went into effect, which I believe preempted a lot of our ability to uh, operate in that particular area. And you can talk to Ledge Council about you know that that sort of issue. But really, freeze your credit reports. Uh, download your credit report. You you have a right to a free credit report from each credit reporting agency each year. So if you wanted to time it, you could every four months download one from Experian, one from Equifax, one from TransUnion. And the reason you download your credit report is because it shows you, first off, well, it shows you all the accounts open in your name. If you see an account that you don't recognize, that's, yeah, that's a red flag, right? You should call that bank uh, you know, or that lender and say, you know, I did not open this report. It's also very important to look at that anyway, because uh, there are frequently errors on these reports. And these are the reports that banks use to determine whether you're credit worthy. So you look at the report and if it says you haven't been paying your bills on time, but you know that you have been paying your bills on time, you know, that's when you fix it. If it says that you lived in a place or your name is wrong, um, I've looked at my credit reports and it has an alias for me that I've never used. So, you know, it's, they, they get things wrong. Um, so you wanna download your reports, if you don't plan, even if you do plan on taking out a loan sometimes to, to freeze your credit report. And then what happens is if you decide you wanna take out a loan down the road, let's say you wanna uh, buy a car, you need your car loan. You say to the car dealership, which credit reporting agency do you use? They say uh, TransUnion. So then you go to TransUnion and put a thaw on your credit freeze. You basically go in and say, you know, for the next week, let people pull my credit report and then put the freeze back in effect. And then you know you can do that. It's it's one of the most effective things you can do. You want to be looking at your uh, at your credit card statements. Make sure that there's no fraud on your credit card statements. Although, you know, I think as far as a social security number breach, that's not as big a concern uh, for you to worry about. Um, there is personal uh, there is personal ID theft insurance that you can buy. You can get a rider on your personal insurance. We don't recommend any particular insurance one way or the other on that. It's a little fraught to try to do that. Um, but these are steps that everyone should be taking regardless uh, because you know ID theft has just become so ubiquitous and so widespread. And it, it, is, a it is a really unfortunate thing. Uh, there are certainly things I think on that question, we as the state might be able to you know, help out more with, but that is a, a separate conversation for another time. Um, so that, that's the advice that I would, I would give. So, Drilling down a little bit on that, uh, it sounds easy to say to someone, freeze your credit report, but you know, a significant number of people are not gonna have any idea what you're talking about or how to do that. What do you do for those people? Well, I think that, I, I think we may have a link on the CAP site that we can direct them to in order to do that. So we can direct them to the instructions that are on the CAP website. Um, Brian, I, can I, yeah, can I jump please, in and also yeah. just say, folks at CAP walk through this with people who call. Like they would be more than happy to say, like, okay, let's call this up together. Okay, you know, you hit this button. All right, we we do that all the time to just you know hold the hand of the Vermonter who might need that extra assistance. They're they're great at that kind of thing. So, um, at, you know, definitely, I would encourage folks who have troubles to call CAP. Yeah. I think I would also just add that, you know, if you if you get a letter 
on government letterhead from, you know, in a government envelope, you should probably trust that letter. If you get a communication about this breach or any other breach that you don't trust or you're not sure about, call CAP. Uh, we get calls about that frequently to ask. We require businesses to uh, send their notices to us. We post them on our website so that people can confirm them. And I say all this because in the wake of something like this, there may be fraud. Fraudsters might see this as an opportunity to contact people and say, you know, give us your social security number so that we can fix this sort of thing. Don't give out your social security number to anybody who calls you out of the blue or sends you an email with a link that says, you know, click here to uh, give us your information to sign up for ID theft insurance or things like that. Uh, so, so be on heightened uh, awareness for potential fraud uh, coming out of something like this. Have you seen anything? Uh, we heard the commissioner say that he's in contact with third parties to provide financial protection services. Uh, have you seen anything in Vermont or other states where there's been a breach by state government, where they've gone to various degrees to uh, help out, even though they're not covered by the Consumer Fraud Act? I don't, I don't know the specifics of, of how specific other states have handled this. I know that it's becoming fairly common in the business community to offer these sorts of additional services. And there are businesses that offer kind of like a bulk license for people to sign up for them, uh, partly because they get offered, a lot of people don't actually use them. So, you know, it might seem like you're offering this very expensive service, but a lot of people don't just you know, choose not to uh, opt into it, which, you know, keeps the cost lower. Um, so I, I suspect it's fairly common for this sort of thing to happen. So would you recommend at this point, let's assume we have entered into a contract with a third party that will provide this service to 44,000 people um, at a not, probably not an insignificant cost to the state budget, but um, would you recommend an, uh, an opt-out provision or, you know, we're going to see far less if people have to sign up, is there any reason why we shouldn't extend it to all the people that have been impacted? And if they choose for whatever reason, they don't want it to have to opt out? You know, I, I honestly don't know if they, if there are ones that operate by an auto enroll that you get it, you know, unless you say otherwise, I've always been under the impression that it's the sort of thing where you get a sign in code and you have to take a step to select it. Uh, I think that, I think that's something that, you know, if, if there is an opt-out possibility uh, and it's cost-effective, then then I, I don't I see that as as potentially you know beneficial. Okay, so what else? I mean, I mean, it sounds to me like what's jumping out at me is that we've got to get the word out to the public, like that there are cures. We're working on it. Maybe give a little more detail. Getting the the cap number and an email address out to people, uh, giving people a sense of calm that uh, it's being worked on and there are effective solutions. Um, you deal with charity, you deal with consumers all the time. Would you agree that we need to do that as soon as possible? Yeah, and actually during the course of this testimony, I think two members of the press have emailed me asking <laughs> for comments. So I think that the, the press is certainly um, interested and I really appreciated at the governor's press conference yesterday. I think that was helpful. Um, I actually did know that a letter went out to folks who might be affected because a friend got one and told me about it. So um, I think that this, you know, slowly the word is getting out and I agree it's very important. Um, and I'd love for folks to know CAP's phone number so that they know that we're a resource if they need help or just information to reassure them. Okay. And quickly, if, I, I, if, just, I was just gonna say, I just was looking at the CAP website and it hasn't yet been updated with this press release in the links below. So it might be helpful to do that right away. So people know that this is the place to look for this information. Thanks. Um, and the other, the other, um, message I suppose would be helpful to send to people is if you happen to be the recipient of one of these missent letters, do the right thing, uh, put it in the self-addressed uh, envelope, send it back to the Department of Labor, 
by getting those back, the Department of Labor will be able to confirm, you know, that the numbers that people received is lower and lower and lower. As even if someone's not going to use it, you know, sending it back would be helpful so that people so that we know that it was made safe. Uh, if they don't want to be bothered to send it back, at the very least, don't just throw it in the garbage. Uh, this is an information with sensitive information. If you have a shredder, shred it. Uh, if you if you don't have a shredder, throw it in your wood stove. Uh, you know, th those are two very effective ways of destroying documents, but this is a sensitive document, even if it's not your document. You know, we're all in this together. These are your neighbor's information. So, you know, just, just you know, please do the right thing and, and, and get those. If you're, if you're talking about evil or nefarious people, I mean, can you rely upon the fact, can the department rely upon the fact that they've gotten the misinformed uh, 1099 back as something they could write off as we don't have to be bothered with this case anymore. I mean, someone can just transpose the information there, put it on a yellow pad and send back the 1099. I mean, I, I suppose so. I mean, certainly, I, I suppose if, if someone, um, you know, it, it sends it back, you know, first of all, I, I suppose another message would be that, you know, uh, it, it, it may be knowable who got which people's wrong social security numbers. Uh, so if you do actually are evil or nefarious, this would be a really dumb ID theft to do because they'd probably be able to trace it back to you pretty quickly. Uh, so, you know, just, just, just do the right thing here. That's, you know, it's always a good message. Okay. Before Michael responds, can I ask something that's kind of directed at Michael? Just when we say do the right thing, I just want to give people really crystal clear information about what doing the right thing is. And I still want to make sure I'm clear, whatever kind of 1099 they got, if, if it's retirement as opposed to a 1099 G, are you just asking for 1099 G's to be returned? Of the 1099 G's, even if they think everything's correct, do you still want them to return it? And if they wrote return to sender and just put it back in the mail before they got the guidance about the envelope, is that also considered doing the right thing? So those are the three questions I just need serious clarity about. Can we, Keisha, would you mind if we take that those specifics offline? We're really running okay. here, and you know we're going to have questions like that that come up throughout the course of the week. And you know, please, you know, maybe put them in writing and copy the committee because we'd all like to yeah. know the answer. I'll do that right now. I'd like to move on. Uh, Commissioner, I see you have a hand up. If it's really quick and essential, let's deal with it. If not, we're probably having you back tomorrow and the next day. So yeah, I will keep it very brief. And it was just to also point out, um, you know, while we cannot be assured that if someone returns the 1099, um, that they didn't copy the information down, but by getting the 1099 back, we can be assured that it didn't uh, get, get, um, uh, tossed in the mail uh, and not destroyed of properly. Um, and so the leakage uh, is, is less likely if they've actually returned the physical document to us. Okay. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you, Charity. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you, Commissioner. We're going to take a five minute break and we'll come back and we'll deal with uh, ACCD issues. Thank you.